Maureen Knight uh, from the University of Washington. Uh, Maureen is known mostly for occupying my former office when I left the University of Washington. And uh, now even she gave up that and uh, she's in a better place. So, but we're truly delighted uh, to, to have her with us today and uh, Maureen make a major contribution to color vision over the decades. And I'm really thrilled to uh, see what she's up to. Caroline, maybe you can formally introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. Now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline, and welcome to today's ophthalmology research seminar. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the Pilchewski's lab, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Maureen Knights. Uh, she's a R.H. Hill professor in the University of Washington School of Medicine. She ran the Knights Lab at the University of Washington and is an accomplished vision scientist and expert in color blindness. Dr. Knights earned her bachelor's degree in the University of San Jose State. She afterwards received her PhD in molecular biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She then completed her postdoctoral training also at the University of California, Central Barbara, doing neuroscience research. Uh, Dr. Knight's research encompasses a depth of topics focusing on visual neuroscience and the mechanisms of color vision, including identifying variants for the human cone photopigments that underline photosector based vision disorders, including age-related macular degeneration, myopia, glaucoma, and color vision deficiencies. She also studies gene therapy geared towards studying forms to cure color blindness and also retinal physiology, having developed tools that demonstrate ASCON signals live in the retina and photopigment sensitivity curves. She has since developed numerous manuscripts, has written numerous book chapters, and is well supported by grants funding from the NEI yeah. to prevent blindness and collaborates with various centers across the country. Furthermore, she has received numerous awards, including Career Development Awards, Scientific Recognition for invest, uh, Principal Investigators and Endowed Professorships, both at as the re Richard O. Schutz, uh, a works and professor by the Medical College of Wisconsin, and also the Ray H. Hill and Chair in Ophthalmology at the University of Washington. She was the recipient for the 2020 Ludwig von Salman Prize for Vision Research from the International Congress on Eye Research. And she's also a member of the International Color Vision Society, the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, the American Association for the Advancement in Science, International Society for Eye Research, and the Alcon Research Institute. Without further ado, it is our pleasure to have Dr. Knights present her talk for today. Well, thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. And it's a great honor to speak in this endowed or distinguished uh, uh, series of seminars. Uh, and um, so since I have all this history of doing color vision research, you might be wondering why the heck I am now doing research in myopia. And hopefully with this talk, you will see the answer to that question. Uh, I have to start with my disclosures. Jay Knights and I are co-founders of a company called Sightglass Vision, which develops products designed to slow myopia progression. We are co-authors on patents licensed to Sightglass, and we receive royalties and licensing fees. So the red and green cone photopigment genes are best known for, or and photopigments are best known for mediating color vision. But common variants of these genes impair cone function disrupting signals that control eye growth during development, increasing the risk of developing myopia. Common variants of the red and green cone photopigment genes increase the risk of having minus two diopters of myopia or worse by 300%. And I'll present data for this a little bit later in the talk. 
About a fourth of the population has an myopia risk allele, making the red-green opsin gene locus the single most important genetic determinant of myopia. But how did this extraordinary prevalence of myopia causing alleles of the red and green photopigment genes arise? That's a question that we've wondered. Well, the red and green genes are highly susceptible to genetic recombination because they're arranged in tandem on the X chromosome. Their copy number varies, and they're nearly identical in sequence over a span of about 40 kb from, that includes the exons, introns, and the region between the genes. And so this has produced an exceptionally high degree of polymorphism among people with normal color vision. And that's illustrated here. Exon three of the genes is particularly variable. And this is a list of 20 exon three haplotypes and their frequencies in a sample of about 400 males with normal color vision. The variability is the result of intermixing the primordial long wavelength sensitive or red photopigment gene and the primordial middle wavelength sensitive or green photopigment gene. There are eight variant nucleotides in exon three. Two of them, this one here and this one here, are part of the same codon, which is codon 171. And I've shown here the whole codon, so that's why there's nine nucleotides, even though there's only eight variant ones. I've shown the middle non-variant position in codon 171. And in each case, the nucleotide has the identity of either the primordial red or the primordial green gene as indicated by the color coding here for these 20 haplotypes. So recombination has mixed these genes um, by, uh, because during cell division, due to the high degree of sequence identity, the copy number variation, uh, there can be a misalignment of the two X chromosomes so that the red gene on one X chromosome can pair with and rec recombine with the green photopigment gene on the other X chromosome. And this has the effect of then intermixing the gene sequences. So now we have two genes that are the, pro the product of that recombination, each of which have both red and green pigment gene sequences. So repeated rounds of this type of recombination over the period of human evolution has led to our current mixed up genes. Well, an association between the conops and gene locus and myopia was first discovered in families that have extreme high myopia. And this was reported by Terry Young's group in 2004 in Archives of Ophthalmology. And in that paper, the uh, affected individuals and in the families that they described had refractive errors of up to minus 25 diopters. That's extremely high myopia. And this first high-grade myopia locus ever mapped was designated MYP1 for myopia 1. And it mapped to XQ28, which is the location of the uh, conopsin genes, the red and green conopsin genes. So the high myopes in Terry Young's families had a combination of polymorphic codons in exon 3, which we call LDAVA, uh, for the single letter amino acid code um, indicating the amino acid specified by it at the polymorphic positions. And this fact that LDAVA is associated with very high grade myopia has been independently confirmed by multiple labs across the world. What was surprising, and what this surprising finding was discovered by a Japanese group led by Uyama's group, uh, is that the nucleotide substitutions associated with the, the combination in LDAVA disrupt exonic splicing enhancers that are required for exon three of the gene to be recognized during pre-messenger RNA splicing. So uh, a little appreciated fact is that within exons, the splicing code is and amino acid sequence code are superimposed. So exons participate in their own splicing. So what I'm showing here in red is a little hexamer sequence that functions as an exonic splicing enhancer. And what this little sequence does is it can recruit accessory proteins that interact with the basal splicing machinery that assembles at the intron exon junctions, and it promotes the inclusion of exon three in the final messenger RNA. A single nucleotide change, whether it alters the amino acid sequence or not, can disrupt that uh, enhancer effect of that hexamer, converting it to a splicing silencer in, in the case uh, I'm showing here. And in this case, now the silencer can recruit accessory proteins that interact with the basal splicing machinery to inhibit the inclusion of exon three in the final messenger RNA. 
It can also just uh, uh, neutralize an enhancer so that no accessory proteins can be um, uh, recruited and it still reduces the overall amount of exon three incorporated into the messenger RNA. So the LVAVA mutations that's associated with very high myopia disrupts enhancers and creates splicing silencers so that exon three is rarely incorporated into the mature messenger RNA. And what this has, um, the effect this has at the level of the cone mosaic is to uh, produce a sub mosaic of cones that express a very low amount of photopigment compared to the neighboring cones that would have a, a normal non exon three skipping um, haplotype. So normally the red and green cones would have similar optical densities of the photopigment. But in the case of the LVAVA variant, one subset of cones has very reduced optical density compared to its neighbors. And so now what I'm telling you is that there's a combination of SNPs that basically abolishes, nearly abolishes exon 3 inclusion. Uh, but what about all these other haplotypes that are very common in polymorphism? Are they associated with any sort of exon 3 skipping? The LVAVA variant is just a combination of the common polymorphisms that occur individually with high frequency. But we would expect that some of the single nucleotide polymorphisms may individually lower the probability that exon 3 will be recognized and give rise to a smaller fraction of the messenger RNA with exon 3 skipped compared to LVAVA. So we investigated the association between the, photo, the red photopigment gene polymorphisms and common myopia in two steps. And the motivation for this is that our idea is this having a sub mosaic of cones with a lower optical density, even a slightly lower optical density, can contribute to um, contrast signaling that stimulates the eye to grow. So the seven SNPs that are single nucleotide polymorphisms, as I already mentioned, have one of two possible identities, which means there are 128 unique combinations of them. Uh, in exon 3. So our first step was to create mini genes with 128 possible exon 3 haplotypes and then evaluate the effect on splicing of each haplotype using an in vitro assay. So the mini gene is basically the LOPS and cDNA, each with a different exon 3 haplotype and with introns 2 and 3 inserted. And the mini genes are then transfected into HEC293 cells and the splicing isoforms are characterized and quantified. And the results are shown here. Um, so here I'm listing the seven single nucleotide polymorphisms we examined, and then the possible nucleotides at each position. We did a non-parametric test, so we're expressed as the median percent exon 3 skipping. So, you know, for example, this shows that when G is present at this particular location, there's 15% of the messenger RNA is missing exon 3 compared to only 8.7% uh, when A is present, and this was not significant. So when all was said and done, after correcting for multiple comparisons, three of the SNPs were significantly associated with um, exon 3 skipping. But what we were looking for is the one with the biggest effect. So we could focus on that. Uh, so we don't lose our power in by looking at too many comparisons. So the nucleotide with the largest effect, we call nucleotide 6. Here's its um, SNP ID. Uh, and it can be either an A or a G. After Bonferroni correction, the association with exon 3 skipping had a p value of 0. 0.0007. And the, the haplotype with the G uh, at this location had 13 times more skipping of exon 3 than haplotypes with A. Uh, so for step two, we tested an association between this exon 3 skipping nucleotide 6 and refractive error. And we did this um, by asking if there's a difference in the refractive error in people who have A versus G at this particular SNP location. And so we did that by sequencing the red and green photopigment genes of 414 males of European ancestry. In order to get this 414 that we could do the final analysis, we actually screened um, over a thousand people, but uh, I don't have time to go into the details of the inclusion and exclusion criteria at the fine level uh, to make sure that we're looking at a photopigment gene that's expressed. Um, but all of these males passed a color, a color vision test. None of them had prior eye injury or surgeries that could affect refractive error. And otherwise, they were unselected for refractive error. 
So the results of that analysis, which was a man with EU test are shown here. The result is that having G at variant nucleotide six is associated with a two diopter shift in refractive error compared to having A. So the median spherical equivalent refraction for the group of individuals that had G at this position was minus 2.9 diopters compared to minus 0.99 diopters for people who had A at that position. This effect size is about two diopters and the p-value is 0 0.005. A minus two diopter effect size is the largest effect size for an individual nucleotide associated with common myopia ever discovered so far. And with this as a proof of principle, we wanted to get a more complete picture of the role of the red photopigment gene polymorphism in common myopia. And we did this by doing a split halves analysis. So we randomized our 414 subjects into two groups of equal size. And then we ranked each group according to the average refractive error for the 11 haplotypes that had frequencies that were greater than 1% of the sample. And we repeated the procedure a thousand times to get a really good average. So with this analysis, if the red photopigment gene haplotypes are associated with myopia, we expect a significant correlation between the two independent halves. And that is what we saw. So uh, each data point here represents one haplotype and the haplotype ranks are shown on the x-axis with this being the most myopiogenic and this being the least myopiogenic. And their mean spherical refractive error um, for the haplotype groups is plotted on the y-axis. And you can see that the range of refractive errors is more than four diopters going from nearly minus one to almost minus five. Uh, and the p-value for this association was 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9, with an r squared of 0.98. Um, so the variants here that are associated with the larger refractive errors here, uh, are they, those increase the risk of having minus 2 diopters of myopia or, myopia or worse by 300%. And this work is now that I just talked about is all published in a paper that appeared in Genes in 2022. And, and what we concluded in this paper is that the combination of a very large effect size and high frequency in the population makes the nucleotide polymorphisms in the photopigment genes the most significant genetic determinants of common myopia. So as you all know, um, the eyes of young children are too short for their optics, making them farsighted, and they undergo a process of emetropization of the eye growing during development. And as the eye grows in length, changes in the contrast of retinal images are monitored by local neural mechanisms in the retina, such as, such as the eye should stop growing at emetropia, at the point where the axial length of the eye is optimally matched to the power of the um, cornea and lens. <laughs> uh, so, so what I'm going to tell you next is our viewpoint, our, our theory of how contrast signaling uh, is involved in myopia. And what we argue is that a failure of the mechanism that uses contrast information to control eye growth allows the eye to grow too long, causing myopia. And I think this is pretty well accepted that it is contrast signaling that is the problem. Uh, but what I'm going to argue is the opposite direction that has typically been, uh, that is in the myopia literature. I'm going to say, I, what I'm going to tell you is that high contrast causes the eye to grow, and by reducing contrast, you can slow the progression of myopia. And why do we care? I know not everybody in this audience, and perhaps most people in this audience aren't um, myopia researchers, and I just want to point out that Myopia is caused by an overly elongated eye. So glasses, contacts, and LASIK surgery can correct the refractive error, but it doesn't do anything to mitigate the risks associated with a too long eyeball. And those risks include blindness later in life due to increased risk of glaucoma, retinal attachment, detachment, and maculopathy. There's also an increased risk of cataracts. So there really is a need to try to intervene early before kids become myopic so that you can reduce the risk of these um, blindness later in life. So by far, the most important function of the human retina in vision is to transform patterns of dark and light falling on cone photoreceptors 
into contrast signals. And this is because our cone-based vision has to operate over a huge intensity range that illuminates objects we see from very dim room light to sunlight that can be millions of times brighter. And this means that uh, a dark object like this where A in sunlight can reflect more light into our eyes than the white square here B does under room light. And so the way our retina allows us to tell light from dark or even to see it all under conditions of hugely changing illumination is by transforming light intensity into contrast. And it does this at the very first synapse between cone photoreceptors and bipolar cells. So the retina of primates, including humans, is unique. So this is something that, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a primate thing. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between cone photoreceptors and midget bipolar cells. And that's illustrated nicely by this work from uh, Uli Grunert and Paul Martin's lab that came out in 2020. And here is an, is an image from that paper in which they took the same slice of a uh, section of human retina and labeled the cones in green here and in that same slice, the bi midget bipolar cells are labeled in magenta. And by counting, what they find is that there are the same number of cones as there are midget bipolar cells. And in this particular section, only the off midget bipolar cells are labeled with the antibody. But every cone has its own private pair of bipolar cells that extract contrast from light intensity in the retinal image. The labeling technique only stings off, but every cone also has an on bipolar cell. And I've illustrated that in cartoon form here. So here's the cone, and then here's its, its private pair of bipolar cells. It has an on bipolar and an off bipolar. These midget bipolar cells make up the vast majority of bipolar cells in the human retina, and they are major carriers of information from cones to the rest of the retina and to the brain. Well, after them. Uh, they're called midgets because they're very small and they connect to a single cone compared to larger diffuse bipolar cells that connect to many cones. The next part of the circuit are the horizontal cells, which provide mutually inhib inhibitory uh, relationship between a cone and its surrounding neighbor cones. So the midget bipolar cells have spatially opponent center of surround receptive fields because of this horizontal cell um, made up of a single cone in the center and the neighboring cones that connect to this uh, horizontal cell in the surround. When both the center and the surround are covered by uniform illumination uh, illustrated by this gray disc, the mutually inhibitory center and surround opponent responses cancel because the same amount of light is falling on both and there's no response from either the on bipolar or the off bipolar cell. Even though there's light falling on the retina, there's no contrast, and so neither one of these bipolar cells produces a response. But if there's more light on the center cell, than there, on the center cone than there is on the surrounding cones, uh, then the on bipolar cell is activated, signaling that there's light against a dark background, for example, a light letter, a white letter on a, on a black background. On the other hand, when more light falls on the surrounding cones than on the center cone, the off bipolar cell is activated, signaling that there is light against, uh, that there's dark against a light background. So light, for example, there's a dark letter on a white background. The midget bipolar cells are contrast detectors and they are the basis for our high acuity detailed vision that allows us to see the contrast <laughs> in our daily lives. So the point is the midget bipolar cells are contrast detectors that give us our high acuity vision. They also carry information that is critical for the amitropization mechanism to stop the growth of the retina during adolescence when the eye is no longer farsighted, which I'm going to tell you about next. So this is a cartoon of the human uh, cone mosaic showing the red, green, and blue cones. And in both the very high myopia and common myopia that's caused by photopigment gene mutations, the cones that express less photopigment are inefficient 
at absorbing light compared to their neighbors. So our red and green cones work together to give us our black and white vision, which I've just described, and the pattern of activity across the retina when one subset of cones expresses less photopigment would look like this illustration. So that even when there's constant illumination, the cones with low optical density photopigment would absorb less photons than the neighboring cells that have uh, a high optical density. And this would give a, a, a signal that there's contrast on the retina, even when there is no contrast. So here's how we think it works uh, in the circuitry. So if the center cone of a bipolar cell receptive field expresses a mutant gene that is less efficient at absorbing light, under uniform illumination, when there's no contrast in, in the stimulus, this center cone will absorb fewer photons than the average of its neighbors, which will be a mixture of normal and mutant cones. And the off midget bipolar cell will respond, signaling that there's high contrast, even in the absence of any contrast in the stimulus. If the center cone expresses, expresses a normal photopigment gene, uh, but a subset of the surrounding cones express the mutation, then under uniform elimination, where there's no contrast in the image or the stimulus, the center cone will absorb more photons than the surrounding cones, and the on midget bipolar cell will respond, signaling that there's high contrast even in the absence of any contrast in the stimulus. So contrast on the retina produced by having a submosaic of the inefficient cones is associated with increased axial growth in myopia. And this is the work that we published in our genes paper and that has been shown with LVABA. The more extreme mutations are associated with extremely high myopia while milder mutations increase the risk of common myopia. But how do we make sense of this very surprising result given the, the, the way the field of myopia has thought about contrast signaling in the past? So I'm gonna to try to explain how we think it works. So hyperopic defocus and myopic defocus both result in blurred images that produce lower contrast on the retina. Uh, in the case of myopia, um, the eye is already too long for the optics, so the image comes to focus in front of the retina and produce, makes a blurry image. Uh, if, if high contrast causes the eye to grow in myopic defocus that blurs the image, lowers contrast and stops the eye from growing, then the finding that contrast signals cause the eye to grow and reducing contrast reduces eye growth would make some sense. So in the natural world, for example, when a child is outdoors playing with her dog, in this case, the dog's named Oreo after the cookie, the dog only fills a small part of the visual field. The dog's face fills only about 15 degrees of visual angle, while the total field of view is more than 120 degrees. And this means that less than 2% of the, of the retina is filled with an image of Oreo's face. Uh, and 98% uh, is filled with the distant scenery. That means that if you are myopic and unable to focus on distant scenery, 98% of your retina is filled with distant, out of focus, low contrast images. For children with uncorrected myopia in the natural world, 98% of the, of the retina is filled with out of focus, low contrast images as shown here on the left. But if high contrast causes the eye to grow and low contrast doesn't stimulate eye growth, the retinal mechanism whereby contrast causes the eye to grow makes sense because then when it, things go out of focus, it stops growing. But what about hyperopia? The visual, the visual system as a whole has to respond differentially to hyperopia and myopia. Just, uh, and the eye has to stop growing when it's no longer hyperopic. In human adolescence, there are two different systems that respond to changes in the pattern of light on the eye, on the retina as the eye grows. There's the accommodation mechanism, and then there's emetropization. So these two mechanisms work in opposite directions. When the eye accommodates, the plane of focus is moved forward relative to the retina. And when the eye emetropizes, the retina moves back relative to the plane of focus. So young eyes are far-sighted, meaning that they can see far away things clearly. 
So even though the hyperopic eye is too short for its optics, the eye can accommodate to bring distant scenery that fills 98% of the retinal image into clear focus. On the other hand, the nearsighted eye accommodation only makes things more out of focus. So for the human visual system, the difference between myopic defocus and hyperopic defocus is that when the hyperopic eye accommodates, distant scenery that fills the retina is brought into clear high contrast focus. But for the myopic eye, accommodation reduces contrast of distant scenery. So imagine a young girl who's still farsighted interacting with her dog, Oreo, who's about a, millimeter, who's about a meter away. And because she's relatively farsighted, she automatically accommodates to bring the distant scenery that fills her vision into clear focus. Even when she attempts to change her focus from distant to near, when she's looking directly at Oreo's face, distant scenery is still relatively in focus. So for the hyperopic adolescent girl, high contrast images from well-focused distant scenery that fills 98% of the retina drives activity in the contrast pathways, signaling her eye to grow. But as her eye grows longer and the distant scenery in the peripheral vision begins to go out of focus for the accommodated eye, as illustrated here, her eye, the her eye stops growing. The reduction in contrast reduces the stimulation of the eye to grow. And ultimately for natural vision in the outdoors, this works perfectly to serve the purpose of having the eye stop growing when it ceases to be farsighted. Because our eye, because of our eye's ability to accommodate distant scenery that fills 98% of our retina, changes in contrast continue, changes in contrast, <laughs> the retina changes in contrast continuously as the eye grows from being hyperopic to myopic. So it makes sense that the emetropization mechanism would work so that the contrast signals on the retina cause the eye to grow and that reducing contrast slows eye growth. And finally, when contrast is sufficiently reduced, the eye should stop growing altogether and the person should be just emetropic. And the human eye evolved to grow so that as adults, we have perfect emetropic vision, but common mutations in combination with unnatural visual stimulation, such as computer screens, uh, and these unnatural stimulations are associated with our modern world. They work together to overstimulate our contrast pathways. And because of this, the world is experiencing a myopia epidemic. And so according to what I've said so far, High, we think that high contrast images that fill the retina out here where it shouldn't be uh, are causing the eye to grow abnormally. And so what would be the solution to this? Well, our solution is eyeglasses that reduce contrast uh, as illustrated here. So as in, so this is the low contrast lens and this is the high contrast lens or standard of care lens. So as an initial test of this idea, we did an experiment where we recruited 14 children between the ages of seven and 11 who had fast progressing myopia. And we had them wear glasses where one lens was a standard of care and the other lens was designed to reduce contrast by introducing light scattering elements uh, in the lens. And here are the results. This, uh, we did the experiment over three months uh, and, and we measured axial length at two week time points over that three month period. Uh, and this is the data for the eye wearing the normal lens. And this is the data for the eye wearing the experimental lens. The black line is the average of data from all of the subjects and all these other colored lines are the individual data points for each child. And what you can see, and this is the normalized axial length of the eye um, on the Y axis. So what you can see is that for the standard of care lens, the eye continued to grow uh, in length. And I should point out that these children were fast progressors. Um, so they were uh, growing by more than a, uh, a diopter per year before they enrolled in this study. Uh, for the experimental lens, we basically massively reduced the um, axial elongation of the eye. So for a subset of the children, there were uh, seven children that re-enrolled and then we switched the lenses so that the eye that had been wearing the normal lens wore the low contrast and the one that was wearing the low contrast now wore the normal lens. And when we did this, 
uh, the eye that had been wearing the low contrast lens went back to growing at the previous rate when switched to the normal lens, and the eyes that were switched from normal to low contrast stopped growing. And here's the same results shown in another way. So this just shows that there's a big difference in the rate of eye growth over that three month span where the low contrast lens virtually stopped the eye from elongating compared to the normal standard of care lens. So this pilot study and the idea that high image contrast stimulates axial elongation of the eye is the basis for the sight glass vision dot lenses and the dot stands for diffusion optics technology. Uh, and these lenses have just completed a 42 month clinical trial um, and an application for FDA approval for the lenses as, as a myopia control device is under consideration. And this is for use in the, in the USA. It's already approved for use as myopia control in other countries. So the, let me just give you a little bit of information about this clinical trial design. So the design of the clinical trial it was a prospect, it is a prospective randomized controlled subject and observer mass, three arm parallel group, uh, 36 month trial. Uh, and then there was a six month extension trial, which is why it's now 42 months. So there was one to one to one randomization with age and baseline myopia balanced across the arms. Of, uh, so there was a control arm and two, two light scattering lenses that differed in the amount of light scattering. The subject or the children were six to 10 years of age uh, that uh, had, had myopia. Uh, and there was a planned uh, 255 subjects total enrollment with about 85 per arm. And then this was at 14 sites in the US and Canada. And I have to also say that this is the only uh, spectacle lens uh, for myopia control that has been uh, a multi-site trial. So the 12 month data for this was recently published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, and the, the trial is called Cyprus for Control of Myopia Using Diffusion Optic Spectacle Lenses. Uh, so the 12 month results show that the difference in spherical equivalent refraction progression for the low density of light scattering versus the control group was, point, was minus 0.4 diopters with a highly significant p-value which corresponded to a 74% reduction in myopia progression. Uh, the test two, which had lower tolerability by the subjects, had a higher amount of light, scatter, uh, the light scattering elements, uh, was minus 0.32 diopters, uh, which corresponded to a 59% reduction. The difference in axial length progression for test one was, which is the low contrast, uh, the, the lower density of contrast um, reduction, was 0.15 millimeters and the test two was 0.1 millimeter. And so test one is the one that's been launched across the world uh, as being available. So it's available in Canada and European Union. I think there was a, there's a planned launch in China. So then the 24 month data for this was presented at Arvo. Um, so this was a planned interim analysis that showed that this, the lenses were safe and effective. And the difference in means between uh, the, the test one lens and, and the control uh, for axial length was minus 0.21 millimeters, uh, which corresponded to it. I think I have my negative signs mixed up here, which corresponds to a spherical referred equivalent refraction of 0.52, which was highly statistically significant. Um, so one of the things, and now the 36 month data is out as well as a 42, uh, as a six month extension. And one thing I just would point out here is that, so the first year of this trial was completed in, um, uh, in 2020, um, like in May of 2020, just before lockdown. Uh, and the trial design was done in consultation with the FDA in the US so that we would know what we would have to, what the benchmarks are that we would have to make in order to get this FDA approved. Uh, and as you all know, the thing that happened in, in, at the end of 2020 was lockdown. And the last thing you really want when you're running a clinical trial that's based on the behavior of children is all of a sudden, on one day, everybody's behavior completely changes. And although there is evidence from reports in China that children's myopia continued to progress and got worse and worse because they all studied harder, the data from the U.S. is Kids can't do math, kids can't read, and they did not study during COVID lockdown. 
So just in conclusion, the dot lenses employ a mechanism of action that's based on scientific discoveries about the relationship between contrast signals in the retina and the actual growth of the eye. And it make, this makes it possible to optimize the efficacy of myopic control while maintaining acuity and tolerability. So with that, uh, here's, uh, okay, Chris, this is my new building at the University of Washington. Here we are at South Lake Union with uh, bugs crawling on the outside of the building. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my funding sources. This work was uh, funded by the National Eye Institute, Research to Prevent Blindness, the Bishop Foundation, and the Ray H. Hill Foundation. And then there are many, many people uh, that helped with this. The, the key person, of course, is Jay. Um, Jim Kuchenbecker was, was instrumental in, in helping with the lens designs. Uh, and then Joe Rapone and Tom Chauberg are part or were part of Sight Last Vision. They have since moved on. Uh, but Joe Rapone uh, designed the clinical trials, and Tom Chauberg uh, was the CEO and, and knew how to start a company, which clearly we did not. Uh, and with that, I would be happy to uh, take questions. I'm going to stop my screen here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, this beautiful, lot of us covers that have just here, uh, for this beautiful talk. Very, very interesting. We have several questions already in the chat. And um, uh, I will start with um, uh, Francis Rucker. Rucker. If she's here, can you please unmute yourself? Okay, if not, maybe Vladimir, uh, please. Uh, yeah, I am here. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. Please, uh, Francis. Yeah, so I, I, my question was, is blur telling the eye to slow growth, if, if blur is telling the eye to slow growth, and a, a, genetic muta a specific genetic mutation is causing a certain amount of blur, um, are you saying then that the eye grades the blur to, to detect? No, no, sorry. So, so, um, I'm saying the genetic mutation causes high contrast. It does not cause a blur when there's no contrast in the image. Nonetheless, because of the difference in optical density, uh, of the photopigment in, in the cones in the receptive field structure, that makes a basal um, level of contrast signaling, even when there is no contrast in the image. So my, this is the problem with myopia. The genetic mutations are causing a contrast signal that by putting these glasses on the kids, we're reducing contrast by light scattering because, because the mutation itself is causing high contrast. So if they have... Um... If they have a mutation um, and and it's causing contrast, then uh, depending on the on this degree of mutation, you would expect a different degree of contrast on their retina. And so, are you saying they keep growing until? I mean, wouldn't wouldn't the contrast from from the environment be superimposed upon that contrast that's already in on the retina? So, it would. Um, confine the effect or um, well there's certainly going to be environmental contrast um, and and there is a differential amount of, of uh, contrast depending on the mutation because for example in the case of LVADA there is a massive contrast signal uh, because the cones expressing LVADA have almost no photopigment in them um, and though that's why they achieve such a high degree of, of Axial elongation, uh, and so our idea is that uh, that the mutations that cause a smaller amount of exon three skipping also produce a smaller amount of contrast signaling, and that 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 would be I think easier to to uh, address with contrast reducing spectacle lenses. I, I guess I'm just confused because if somebody has uh, emetropia and their distance vision is very sharp, then that would they, you're saying that their eye would grow until it starts to become blurred and then they, they would slow the growth. So um, in that case, you would expect there to be this sort of seesawing of the refraction around emetropia, which we don't really see. What I'm saying is that the contrast signaling is changing constantly across the retina as a child's eye grows from being hyperopic 
to emetropic. And at some point that it, so, and when, when those children accommodate, they bring the distant scenery into clear high contrast. Uh, so, so I'm talking, so in the natural world, and so the genetic mutations completely bypass this, this mechanism, but this is the mechanism, we're trying to argue how this contrast mechanism works like in the natural world, which is that, so then as, as the eye grows to, to emetropia at some point, the accommodated eye, because the eye has now gotten longer, it can't get as clear focus of the distant scenery. And so the image is slightly out of focus and that is a signal for the eye to stop growing in the natural world. So we use that thinking and the fact that are thinking about how these genetic mutations work to develop these eyeglasses, which also work. So that's just, that's sort of, so there, there are clearly gonna be things about the mechanism that, that you know, we hypothesize, but we don't, you know, we don't know for sure yet, uh, but this is, this is where we are. We have, you know, genetic mutations that clearly cause optical density differences and that would affect contrast signaling. And we have eyeglasses that by reducing contrast um, can, uh, can reduce axial elongation. So, thank, thank you so much. Maybe now we will move to uh, Vladimir. Uh, Emily, I hope you can hear me. Hi, Vladimir. Sitting in the back of the audience. That great talk and love the normal Rockwell picture at, the, at your uh, title slide. Uh, <laughs> a couple of uh, questions for you. First, uh, when you lower the contrast in one of the eyes, wouldn't that uh, offset the EC contralateral signaling to the brain and affect the, the neuronal connections there? I'm thinking it's extreme, obviously. In, uh, in strabismus, where you put an eye patch on one of the eye, which which tends to again offset the balance. So, wouldn't that affect ultimately how the brain is wired, dipsy versus contralaterally? So, so there appears to be a critical period for the strabismus development, and we were very careful to um, have enrolled kids that are past past being at risk for that. And the other thing is, we measure their stereo vision. So when we, when we measured their stereo vision, every week when they came in, that was one of the study procedures was to, to make sure that wasn't happening. Okay, thank you. And my second question is uh, your, your model about how the polymorphisms kind of re result in contrast was very elegant. And my question is, uh, if you have uh, polymorphisms where the cause will, rather than not signaling will completely degenerate, that should not result in kind of fake contrast, kind of artificial contrast, and that should not result in myopia. Is this really the case? Have you looked at polymorphisms where the cause degenerate and are they associated with uh, myopia? Uh, well, there are lots of different kinds of mutations, genetic mutations that block signaling in the on pathway that are associated with, with high myopia. Um, and so, I'm not, so the answer to the, I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know what kind of signaling is happening through those bipolar cells as the cones degenerate. So it's possible that it can go either way. And I don't know the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John? Oh, yeah. Um, great talk. Uh, I, this might be a maybe naive question, but I was just wondering, uh, so if the eyes are growing, does that mean that the density of the photoreceptors is changing, that the packing is all because they're being spread out more or something like that? Or is, all, is it more the shape? It's the same like surface, but the shape is changing towards a more of elongated structure? Uh, or, or if there's a development of more photoreceptors as the eye is changing? Uh, well, there's not more photoreceptors. The eye is definitely stretching, and there's a lot of stress on the retina, which is why people that have high myopia um, get retinal detachment. And and it, and I think it's also part of the deformity of the optic disc in glaucoma uh, is due to the stretching of of the eye. So the um, there's not more photoreceptors. Uh, there is thinning uh, of of the retina. Uh, associated with high myopia. Um, uh, now, uh, Dana Velasquez, um, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? 
Yes, I, I might have missed it, but I was just wondering if the participants in the study were genotyped ahead of time. And if they if they were, did was it a requirement to have that LVAVA haplotype? Right. So the answer is, so we did not include anybody uh, in, in our eyeglasses study that had one of these super skipping um, haplotypes because <laughs> we're not sure that we could stop that from growing. I mean, that is such a strong signal. Um, and so in our initial pilot study that we did with the, uh, within subjects control, we, um, wrote the, we wrote a very different IRB application than the IRB application that was approved. Our initial uh, application, we said we wanted to do genetic testing of the subjects prior to enrollment. And the IRB said, no, you cannot do that because these are children and we don't know. Um, we wanted to do a longer study and they said, no, you can only do three months. So our, our, what we were allowed to do was, was tied our hands were tied by by the IRB. So we did the best we could. We didn't think we would see any effect in just three months, but so we were very surprised about that. In the Cypress trial, we did do genotyping on the on the on the children who were um, were who opted into that aspect of the study. Uh, it, it wasn't part of the FDA uh, uh, data, um, although they have they have they have the, the data that we did collect, but we didn't say that that was part of what was gonna be one of our benchmarks. Uh, what we found, so one of the things that we, so the, the thing that I should point out, I did make the point that our genetic study was focused on males. Uh, and females are a little bit more susceptible to being myopic than males. And um, in the Cypress study, they're the, of the people that agreed to the genetic analysis, more were females than were males. Uh, and females have two X chromosomes, and almost always they have two different haplotypes of the red photopigment gene and two different haplotypes of the green photopigment gene. But superimposed on this with the genes is that they're, the copy number varies, but only the first two genes on any X chromosome are expressed. So in our analysis, we what I, what I didn't give you is the details of how much work we had to do to make sure that we were haplotyping the gene, a gene that we knew was expressed, because you know the only way the photopigment can contribute to myopia is if it's the expressed gene, an expressed gene in the eye of the subject. So we did not get enough haplotype data from the Cypress study to make strong conclusions about specific haplotypes in that population, because they were all myopic, so there was no control population that would contribute to myopia. Uh, but we were able to show that none of them had one of these super exon three skipping their um, haplotypes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Dominic. <clears throat> uh, hi, Dr. Knights, this is Dominic from Chris's lab. A very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering, uh, when we observe the reduction of uh, cone ops in the expression on the protein level, I mean, um, and you also observe, do you observe the reduction of um, uh, cone outer segment uh, length and how much is it uh, of the uh, when it comes to opsin versus the length of the outer segment and is it proportional so the way that we were able to look at that um, is in um, because there's no animal models of this uh, so the way we looked at it is in human living human patients. <coughs> So we use the electroretinogram to measure the, um, the uh, activity of the cone photoreceptors. And, and you can see that the, that the, that the amplitude of the B wave is, is proportional to, appears to be proportional to the amount of photopigment. It's certainly consistent with the amount of reduction uh, in, for example, the LVAVA. There's another variant that is even more reduced called LIAVA. Uh, and so we had individuals that had single, a single photopigment gene on the, they're males with a single photopigment gene on the X chromosome that had the LVAVA or that had the LIAVA. So we were able to look using the electroretinogram. We were also able to look using uh, OCT and then adaptive optics imaging is where you can see. Um, so that's, a, that's the best of the image that we have. That's all we, that's, that's where that data comes from. Um, Tony, I see you have a question, but I will ask you to have a final comment, okay? 
and uh, now David Tralio. Hi, Maureen. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. It was great. Um, I guess my question, I, I, let me preface this with a statement that I think you and, and Jay and, the, and your team with Cyclass and, and all the research you're doing it produced a model crisis in our understanding of, of emetropization and visual control of eye growth. And, um, you know, that's fine if, you know, we're going to uh, move to, you know, shift the paradigm, but I'd like to know how you guys think and reconcile your results, particularly the sight glass um, uh, contrast um, lenses uh, with the with the experimental model data on um, diffusers that have shown that with a grading amount of diffusion, which is reducing contrast, you get increasing eye growth and, uh, and myopia development. And that together with the uh, findings that when we put defocusing lenses on, on animals, uh, producing either myopic or, or hyperopic defocus, which are contrast reducing, we still, the eye can extract information about the sign of defocus and regulate the growth in such a way that it can emetropize. Well, the way we reconcile is, it, it is to say that those models aren't mimicking what's actually happening in human emetropization and myopia development. That the, the that the model is fundamentally flawed. Not not an answer anyone wants to hear, but that's that's how. I think. Uh, yeah, but I think I, I think uh, okay, that that seems to be a little bit of a cheat because you still have to explain well what is going on in those conditions where there's visual input, we're, we're modifying visual input onto the eye, and we can produce growth and refractive changes in a predictable manner. And many of those results have been translated to the development of, of optical treatments that are at least as well, if not better, at reducing myopia progression. So the other optical treatments that are available are not as good as, as ours. A and B, uh, or as sight glasses, uh, and B, um, uh, every single optical device out there that is effective is reducing contrast. Even though people don't acknowledge it, but at the IMC meeting, there was a huge shift <laughs> to people accepting that, oh yeah, you know, our lenses, the Hoya people, yes, our lenses are reducing contrast. The Stella's people, yes, our lenses are reducing contrast. So the people, you know, the argument is what we keep saying is everybody else out there has their optical device, but everybody's every device that is effective is reducing contrast. And those diffusers are way, way, I mean, we're not talking the small effect that we're talking here in our sight glass study. Those are massive you know, changes in, you know. No, 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 that's not three true. Lenses been, plus 10 lenses. There have been experiments that have shown that small amounts of, of diffuser, of, of diffusing um, images on, on, the, on the retina of chicks will produce shifts in, in eye growth and myopia. And these, they're around the order of the kind of contrast that you guys are showing too. Now, I, but I don't know what the circuitry is in a chicken compared to the human with the well, relationship between cone and midget bipolar, because that's, you know, I'm not sure how emetropization naturally works in a chicken. So some of the modeling done in chickens might be chicken specific. Well, this is also done in primate as well. So the diff, both the diffusers and the... Um, and the uh, yes, I know, you do it in lenses. marmosets, but the same level... I mean, we're, yeah, we're there, actually there's work by um, in, in rhesus macaque with diffusers, graded diffusers that show increasing growth and in myopia development. Now, I you know, but the, the, this is an important area to investigate and to think about. And and yeah, I agree that your your results is uh, that are producing a, a paradigm shift in the way we think about uh, how these things work. And there's no doubt about that. And I would just I just wonder maybe 
Francis Rucker was saying something that I thought was an interesting observation, and that is that if you have retinas with in, inherent to the retinal, uh, the photoreceptor uh, mosaics, uh, a tendency to read more or be more um, contrasty, how that works on top of the natural signals that are uh, Im imposed on the retina, maybe some of the solution may lie in that interaction. So, um, you know, your, your view is, um, you know, so, somehow a, a comparison across the, the, the visual field of central and peripheral, but um, it's, you know, quite possible that it's a, a, a temporal as well as a spatial integration of the information. So uh, I, yes, you know, well, we certainly don't know everything. We, <laughs> I told you, I told you everything we, we know so far and how we think about it. Um, so there certainly are many more problems to be solved and much more mechanism to be understood that we, that we have no clue about. And, and let me just say for the record for everybody that, you know, I, I think that this is terrific work and that this is really, you know, we have to integrate all of this together. I'm not taking one side versus another. So thanks, yeah. Morgan. Thank you. Thank you for comments. Can we ask uh, Dr. Swaruk for his comments now? Or his question. Yeah, hi, Maureen. Um, this is this is wonderful. I'm I'm seeing you after such a long time, and um, I've always sort of enjoyed our discussions. Uh, I remember old times, and being a Dutton of myself, but not having myopia. I, I mean, I I feel I feel blessed that I don't have some of those variants that you were talking about. Um, I was intrigued by your, uh, your, you know, your presentation always is very nice, very nicely illustrated for some of us colorblind people uh, with all those. Uh, um, one of the things which was intriguing for me is the connection that you were making, and maybe this is just my naivety or ignorance uh, from cones uh, to uh, these midget uh, cells and off cells and the on cells and how that circuitry can, can really change uh, sort of eye growth in, in a way, if I understood correctly, because it's telling uh, you know, uh, the growing eye that you have to behave in a different way. If that is the case, uh, do you think some genes or genetic mutations in off bipolar cells uh, may have some impact on eye growth and maybe uh, genes causing myopia. Has anybody thought of, uh, I mean, if your prediction or if, if the way you are thinking is right, at least they might be, I mean, there are a lot of families out there probably in my, with myopia and patient, maybe somebody ought to do a screen of some uh, genes that are uh, specifically, or at least uh, dominantly expressed in off uh, bipolar cells. Am, am I am I thinking in a correct way or? Uh... Yes, yes, you are. And the fact is, so that so that congenital stationary night blindness associated with off on pathway defects, anything that affects the on pathway, like NYX, um, CSNB, you know, one or two, those things are associated with very high myopia. Um, so things that block the on pathway are associated with high myopia. They're, they tend to be rare, but you know, like the the NYX gene, you know, that thing is that is a weird gene. You know, it's got three exons, and one of them is you know massive. Um, and so, and, but the defects in those that are are, I think that defects in those things that cause congenital stationary myopia are understudied and and under. I mean, we've had people in the lab that have. Um, that had congenital stationary night blindness, but they don't they they don't do anything about it because there's nothing that can be done. But those people tend to have very high myopia. So yes, things that block the on pathway, particularly the on you know the the trip M1, um, the metabotropic glutamate you know MGUR6 mutations in MGUR6, those people have high myopia. Yeah, but off bipolar. I was thinking. I mean, if there are mutations yeah, well, that so can that can activate some of these off cells, uh, sort of somehow 
you know, in a way, then they also could be. I mean, of course, we don't know enough about those genes yet, but uh, I right. I mean, it's possible, but there's no association out there. So, I mean, there's no um, no screening done yet. I don't know if there. I don't know of any off bipolar specific um, mutations mutations that affect signaling through the off bipolar specifically that are associated with high myopia. But it could just be my, you know, lack of lack of reading enough. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Brown. Hi, Andrew Brown here from UCI. Um, so when we talk about myopia in clinical context, and we hear about atropine, low dose atropine treatments, and of course China has the enacted the policies for having children go outside for a couple hours a day. So with the atropine treatment, um, this is when they're wearing their refractive correction and they lose the ability to accommodate for near tasks. That agrees with the idea of uh, kind of a hyperopic defocus or blur. And the second one is when the pupil is dilated, you know, all of my patients who have a floater, their floater goes away when the pupil is dilated. So they have a loss of contrast from objects inside the eye. So maybe that contributes as well to additional loss of contrast. But for people who are, for the children who are sent outside during, during school, they're going to a much brighter environment with presumably higher contrast in all activities. So how do you reconcile the higher contrast treatment in that context? Or do you think it actually is truly higher contrast environment or is just a brighter environment? Because for our AMD patients, they have low contrast and we help tell them to increase the number of lights in their house and you know, reduce things that they could trip on because of low contrast vision. Yeah, well, certainly the amount of light they're, that they're getting outdoors is a lot more, but they're also probably getting much lower contrast because just in general, you know, and they're not, things in the distance, if they can accommodate, will go into focus if they're hyperopic, but these kids are myopic already. So the, the accommodation is just making, making things blurrier for them. So going outside just adds more light. If these are myopic children, which they have to be if they're getting atropine. Right. So the and but in the population studies, all the children are going outside. And so you would say that they're getting a defocused or a blurred vision in comparison to indoor environments. Yeah, well, I'd say that the, the when they're if they're trying to, yeah, if they're trying to accommodate in sort of to bring objects at different distances into focus which you do less indoors when you're looking at things up close, you know, that these kids are presumably in school, so they're looking at things close. But if they're outdoors, now they're looking all around. Um, and so they're probably trying to accommodate, they may be, I don't know, they may be, I'm not an optometrist. They may be trying to accommodate more, but the, the major effect that they're having being outside is they're getting a lot more light. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're getting more contrast. Uh, and I don't, you know, not all myopia is caused by cone, cone photopigment mutations. Some of it is clearly environmental by, you know, the stimulation that we get by having high contrast signals from our abnormal, you know, lifestyles where we're staring at computer screens all, time, all the time. Thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Shodari. Hi, Maureen. Nice to meet you. Um, Hi. Recently met at ARI, so it's yes. good to see you. Um, I just wanted your, to know your thoughts on how scleral remodeling in myopia is related to these genetic mutations. Does that happen simultaneously, or is it a cause and effect? What do you think? Uh, well, so I don't know the answer. I think that it's unrelated. So I think the scleral remodeling stuff is normally happens. Um, I, I, the cone photopigment mutations, I don't think has any direct effect on scleral, re, re, you know, except for the eyes is, is growing. Um, so I, I don't, so there's a big gap between <laughs> retinal signaling and scleral remodeling. Um, and to me, that's the unknown zone. Um, Actually, up to this, I, if I Thank can you. add a small question, because it's exactly to this Dorota here. Um, what about uh, uh, muscle actually action? So this is uh, clear stress. I mean, clear information. So basically the um, whole um, muscles um, working with lens may give the information to whole eye 
what do you think about that? As a mechanism of stopping, because the, at the moment we have a better, a better um, contrast, with the better vision, we stop uh, using those muscles that offer. Is it possible? I, I guess I'm not entirely sure what the question is. How how the how the ciliary muscles and accommodation is affecting? Yes. Yes. Well. Accommodation is, you know, just it, it, except for people accommodating to um, bring change their focal plane. Um, th that that clearly affects the contrast of what I mean. The what you're looking at has contrast, and so that can change that. But I don't know. Our model does not take into any account what the muscles are doing and how that influences things, except for what happens when you're accommodating uh, in natural vision. I was just uh, hypothesizing that when you actually achieve the good vision, then you don't strain your muscles that often, and that could be part of the signal to stop growth of the eye. But you know, it's not completely hypothesis. Yeah, and I have and I have no idea. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Jones. Brian, would you mind your question, your comment? Oh, it, it was my question was a was a comment uh, basically in, in reply to to uh, Trulio. Yeah, it wasn't a question. Okay. Oh, I saw, I saw your comment, though, Brian. Yeah, no, but it's 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 actually an interesting point uh, in that you know we're, we're we're trying to we're trying to make circuit level decisions. Uh, in different model systems, uh, and, and there's been like this huge debate in the directional selectivity, you know, community as well, right? You know, between mouse and rabbit results, uh, and, and just some of this is going to come down to, to, to network connectivity, and um, and it, it's, it's it's why you know we, we've been working with you guys so much over the last you know, little while. Anyhow, lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let me ask for the final comment. Dr. Well, I just wanted to say, Maureen, I was thrilled by the work that you presented. Uh, I'm a cornea person and was on council 15 years ago. And when I saw what was going on in myopia, it, I thought it would be an insurmountable area to really get an answer. And you guys have really done an amazing job, you and your other researchers. And the clinical trial that you're involved in is admirable. And I had one question. How do you measure the amount of time that the youngsters are wearing these glasses? Uh, how do you control for that? That is a really, really key question. So uh, it's... Um, that is why you know the design of the study was when everybody was going to school and everybody has a particular behavior during the school year so they're supposed to agree to wear their glasses a certain amount of time and then they're supposed to write in a journal there when they're wearing their glasses and the parents are supposed to be monitoring this as well and so the problem we had with with this the the second and third year data is that parents really had no idea how often the kids were wearing the glasses uh, because the, everybody was so stressed by being home from work and home from school. Everybody's off in their separate rooms and the kids were not wearing their glasses as much as they, they were supposed to. But nonetheless, we, um, we included all of the data. Um, and, and so, uh, so we did, we do the best we can in trying to monitor it and, and have people self-report, but there's really not very much we can do. I mean, ultimately, the, the thing we'd like to ultimately be able to do is attach something <laughs> to the glasses so that we can then monitor when they're being worn versus not being worn and we could get electronic data. But that was not available to us during this trial. Thank you very much. We Thank you. Thank you our speaker again. Next week for the All right. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you. Bye.